A caravan was making its way through the fringes of Alamegan territory. They had stopped to give their chocobo some rest and make sure all their cargo was still secure, but they failed to understand how poor of a resting spot they had chosen. Within minutes, a territorial group of beastmen made their move to slay the trespassers and take their goods as payment for their crime. The caravan members tried valiantly to defend themselves, but they were outnumbered and caught unprepared. The caravan's leader tried to rally everyone to a defensive position, but eventually was dragging the wounded into the shelter of their wagons, waiting for the beastmen to bear down on them. But the attack never came. It was strange. She could hear the beastmen outside, but something had changed. They were panicking. She gathered the courage to look out over the plateau where the archers were, only to see someone garbed in deepest red rushing between the beastmen with lethal precision. A blade was dancing from their savior's hand like it was an extension of themselves. As they turned, a devastating blast of magic was released from their other hand, striking the ground forces from the vantage point they had claimed. The caravan leader watched in shock as this singular mage sowed fear in the hearts of the beastmen, making them retreat as they realized they couldn't overcome this caster. When the battle was won, the mage looked over the caravan and saw the leader holding her wounded. They slowly walked up to her, with a medium floating beside their head, and demanded she present the wounded. After bringing them forward, the mage reversed the grip on their blade, holding it backwards like a scepter. A gentle glow came from the hilt and medium that had attached itself to the end, closing their wounds. They stayed and healed all the travelers before ordering the caravan leader to make for Gridania as fast as they could, and that they would make sure the path was safe. Without another word, the mage cloaked in deepest red used their power to dash back up the high ridges of the fringe, out of sight, yet ready to strike. Versatility is underestimated far too often. If two things of equal power face off, then it's the one with more options that will claim victory, as their opponent will have nothing to counter them with. One class in particular has personified this sense of versatility and brought it to its peak. But, in exchange for flexibility, they've sacrificed relentless power and absolute restoration. Today, my friends, we shall truly understand what it means to be a red mage. Red magic's origin is tragic, to say the absolute least. The school was born from the consequences of black and white magic causing the sixth umbral calamity, the calamity of water. As the world flooded, a comet of unknown origin signaled that the mountains of Girabanya were the best place to find refuge. Those simply trying to survive didn't question it. They moved north to higher ground without hesitation. In this group of survivors were none other than the mages responsible for the calamity. Black mages of Mach and white mages of Amdapur were shunned, cursed, and even attacked for their hand in ruining the world. If it wasn't for the overwhelming power of these mages, they might have been wiped out then and there, but no one dared provoke the mages of black and white to the point of anger, out of fear of being obliterated. However, most of these surviving mages had lost their fighting spirit. So many of them were racked with guilt, knowing that it was their own overzealous spells and neglect for the land that had killed countless innocent people and destroyed their proud nations in the floods of the Calamity. This is why when the Black Mages of Mach and White Mages of Amdapur met atop the hills overlooking the flood, they threw down their stabs and scepters swearing never to use these schools of magic ever again. No longer did these mages have a home or a country to fight for, the Calamity had taken everything. As penance for their crime, they pledged to unite as brothers and sisters of magic to form a new school of the arcane. It's from this unity that red magic was born. The mages realized that it was the excessive draining of ambient aether from the world that allowed things to go out of control so easily. As such, 
The first rule of this new school of magic was that it would only ever use the Aether of the Caster. All the mages agreed, and had faith they could find a way to make more efficient use of a mortal's limited Aether. Secondly, they established that this school of magic would only ever serve the world, never a singular nation or ruler. Once again, the mages agreed unanimously, stating that this new form of magic should only serve to prevent calamities and suffering. Only then would they be able to truly begin paying for their sins. Lastly, they moved that this school should be the marriage of the two arts that devastated the world. Finally, they all nodded in agreement, hoping that the knowledge they gained to perfect black and white magic might serve to raise this new form of spellcraft to untold heights. It's unknown how long it took them to study and research this new form of magic. It's theorized they didn't share knowledge of these experimental periods with anyone because they didn't want people to be tempted to use the black or white magic that was instrumental in making this school. What we do know are the results. High in the mountains of Girabanya, this new magic finally took its first breath, and it shined with shades of vermilion for all to see. Given the color this new school gave off, it was dubbed Red Magic, and was finally ready to protect our star. As they experimented with Red Magic, they found ways for it to adopt some of Black and White Magic's more recognizable spells. At first, they proudly added the word Vermilion to the start of these spells, labeling them as Vermilion Flare and Vermilion Holy. However, it didn't take long for slang to dig its claws into the spells for the sake of simplicity. This is why most red magic spells were shortened to the word ver. With these new versions of black and white magic, the mages stripped themselves of their black and white robes and all wore cloaks of red as both a symbol of their new school and their new philosophy. At first, the Red Mages of Girabanya were hailed as heroes and saints. They gave up everything to protect the meek and defend the innocent from catastrophe, whether it be from man or monster. But as time went on and the mages began to grow old, they saw fewer and fewer people taking up the Red Mantle. Even though this school of magic was considered perfect by the mages that crafted it, it was difficult to learn and even harder to master because of the self-imposed limitations that was placed on it. As such, red magic slowly began to fade into obscurity as the need for heroes during an age of peace began to disappear. Now only a handful of people understand its origins and power, and even fewer know where the red mages lived in the mountains of Girabanya. But as obscure as the school became, it never died. There was always someone in Eorzea willing to pick up the Red Mantle when they looked for it. This willingness to share their knowledge with valiant souls gave rise to a small group of Red Mages in Alamigo called the Crimson Duelists, but only one of these duelists now survived today. However, this means there are still Red Mages up in Girabanya, waiting to share their craft with those worthy of it. That is the true history of Red Mages, from their devastating origin to their heroic desires. But now, let us go over the powers of a Red Mage and understand what limitations would cause it to fade from history. As stated earlier, Red Magic is the brilliant union of black and white magic, but with certain restrictions placed on it. The absolute power that comes from black and white spells is the mage's use of both their own aether and the ambient aether around them. By limiting themselves to their own personal aether and refusing to use ambient aether, a red mage is already placed at a disadvantage when compared to its two towering predecessors. To overcome this restriction, red mages found a way to turn every drop of aether they had into power. This method is reflected in their movements and blade work. You see, a red mage doesn't simply channel magic through a traditional focus to create spells. 
Their body is the focus. Every movement of their hands, feet, and even the momentum of their bodies is used to write spells into the air. This is why a red mage is so fast at casting their spells and why they appear so animated compared to black mages and white mages. Their movements are constantly supplying signs and somatic components for their spells as they verbalize their incantations. This method of spell casting is extremely aether efficient, allowing a red mage to endure long sessions of combat without tiring. As impressive as this is, it's the first reason red magic began to fade. To get the most out of being a red mage, you have to be quick on your feet, flexible, and have a strong enough foundation of personal aether to pull from. Unfortunately, not all mages are nimble, and many aren't able to keep up with the intense physical training that comes with using red magic. Those who were strong enough to keep up usually had no interest in spells, and those who had a knack for magic typically failed to strengthen their bodies. The ceiling for red magic was high, and only a handful of people could reach it. But those that were both strong of mind and body found that this school's versatility was unmatched. Fast, destructive magic, potent healing spells, support-based incantations, mobility, and finally, a strong melee presence. Though I must admit, this school of magic is not a master of these arts individually by any sense of the imagination. Their destructive force isn't as strong as black magic, and their curing spells could never hope to replace white magic. But no other profession in the world has managed to bundle so many different arts into a single lethal package. Lastly, Red mages found a way to grasp at and hold the residual energy released by their own spells. They basically found a way to recycle their own spent aether. By collecting the scraps of their own magic, they eventually have enough power to surprise their foes with a barrage of empowered melee attacks. And with stronger glyphs woven into the air by their empowered movements, stronger spells are able to be released. Finally, let's go over the history of their weapons and attire. It's not known when exactly red mages picked up swords as their tool for writing spells in the air and onto their opponents, but it was seen as the most efficient method. They didn't settle on rapiers and foils until they were found by an elzen named Count Ganelon. This nobleman was staunch in his desire to teach swordsmanship to those who had the heart for it, and he never wavered from that philosophy despite people's hatred for the once black and white mages. Count Ganelon was famous for his dueling prowess, and his style of swordsmanship lives on in red mages to this very day. Even the Count's favorite sword named Murglay was copied and passed down through generations of red mages to continue the Count's legacy. But it's hard to talk about a red mage's sword and not its other half. The floating medium that is suspended by the red mage's aether acts as an extension of them as much as the blade itself. The focus is meant to weave signs and spells into the air just like the red mage's body and blade, making for more complex symbols. By holding the blade backward, the medium is able to comfortably rest at the hilt, turning them both into a scepter just long enough to release powerful spells. The first thing people will notice is how different their attire is from traditional mage garb, and they'd be right. A red mage's coat and accessories are meant to grant the greatest protection it can without restricting the freedom of movement. Since mobility is important to red magic, no heavy robes or tight dresses were ever seen as practical by this school. It's theorized that their sleek and flexible wardrobe was also a recommendation of Count Guénelon, since the most prominent red mage clothes have obvious Ellis and designs and origins. And that brings this lecture on red mages to a close. There's never a good excuse for a calamity, but at least something noble was able to emerge from the flood. 
While red mages may be rare, they've never stopped in their quest to halt disaster and avert tragedy. But with tensions finally calming in Garibania, we might just see a rise in red magic after all these years. To those who have picked up the red mantle, hear me now. While you may not be the destructive force or tireless healer that your predecessors were, you are a blade. A blade so quick and sharp that your movements will cut out the festering ruin of this star and purge it with vermilion light. Good day! Thank you for staying to the end of my lesson. It's my hope that you found something new and interesting in between my ramblings. If you did, consider subscribing and liking this video. Doing that is the easiest way to tell me I'm doing a good job at feeding your thirst for knowledge. If there is a topic you'd love to learn more about that I've yet to cover, let me know in the comments and I'll see where my research takes me. I'd also encourage you to share what you learned here with your friends and adventuring companions, and if they're interested, bring them to the next assembly. I hope to see you and any other curious travelers in the next lecture. Till then, stay safe my friends.